Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. But yeah, I guess I was. Uh, I'll try this one more time. I'll make Amy Barnett a co host. Okay, very good. So let's. Let's uh, take a look here at SSE. So I guess I need to uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, we want to look and revisit these stocks. This, of course, is GameStop. So you see it's trading at 60. So wait a minute, I thought it was 166. No, just kidding. It's down another 100. And I guess those uh, 60 calls are, you know, looking a little bit less hopeless. And uh, we're short some 60 calls in this class. And anyway, so you see this just gives you a trading graph. And this is just an example of, I guess this is what you call a hockey stick. And this is an extremely rocket, uh, extreme rocket stock, but that's not the only rocket stock we're looking at. But hey, look, this is the market depth. I just want you to see here on the left, uh, we have the, uh, the bids and we have the asks or the offers on the right. Or the, these are, uh, this is what they call the ask and this is the bid. So yes. Can you see all of these? What are the majority of these brokers that have the bids and the asks on these stocks? I assume you can read this. So up here we have, uh, if you, this is the lowest price if you, uh, if you wanted to sell it. And this is the highest price, the lowest highest price if you were wanting to buy. So if you wanted to buy buy right now, there's uh, you could, there's someone out, out there willing to buy it from you for 65, or you could buy it from them for 65.79. So that's what it would cost to do it. But most of these are on the ARC exchange. So this is an example of a very uh, heavily traded stock, but it's all on one uh, automated exchange, which means this is mostly robot activity, uh, taking care of a lot of. Um, orders generated by high frequency traders and, and uh, manic uh, humans. But look here, there's a little warning up here that says this stock is hard to borrow. And that's what Lynn's gonna talk to us about today. And that's another thing I'm excited about. But we were also looking not at, um, well, let's just take a look at the options here. So I've dialed up the March 9th, the monthly options, and you see uh, there's a lot of activity here. These are around 20 to 30, 20 to 25 dollars here uh, in this range. So that's still March. So most of that is like time value. So but this is a very deep market right now, as obviously you can see. But now we also were looking at uh, Best Buy, or not Best Buy, but Blackberry. And you see, it looks pretty bad. Uh, looks just like that over on this in this range here. But if we look at it on an hourly chart, it, this all of them basically have this kind of pattern uh, of the stocks down here where we had the first jump up on the 14th of January. And this is all kind of how it works. And a matter of fact, we've had students in the class saying, well, you should be able to uh, model this with simple filters. And that's, and that's true. Uh, you just need to give it some time. Now over here are the best trades or the most recent trades. So for instance, um, it sold at 11.97. And here's one in 98. Sold on Nasdaq 100 shares. So these are the trades. These are the quotes over here. And that is. Uh, so now let's look at Signal, which is the 
a stock that Elon Musk, uh, or he, well, he didn't, he didn't tweet about any stock. Uh, he tweeted about no longer using some kind of apps or a uh, message service, but to use the signal messaging service. And so everybody picked that up on Reddit or whoever picks those things up and uh, they start doing internet searches on, on uh, signal and they get this medical device company, which uh, had never really any, um, uh, history to it at all. It was always an over-the-counter bulletin board stock until we get here, and now it's popped up all the way up to 60. So that is that one, and we were looking at just one more, two more. AMC looks just about the same, and it is continuing its fade today. And now here's one our class members told us about. Who was that that mentioned Hillian? Oh, that was me. Will? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so here's, here's your Hillian. And this is an example of a stock that had a big bubble and uh, this was this just looks like the peak of 2000 to 2002, but it's not, it's just over the space of a month. Uh, so it may not get back up to 38 or 40 until until the other side of this, you know, peak uh, trough. But there's Halion and that is, uh, has some history to it. And then here's one, a new one that um, Xing Yang told us about, Mr. Lin. And okay, so this is 2020. This stock, I guess, came out IPO'd around $12 and had immediate run up to $84 within uh, like three or six months or two or four months or something like that. And it's had this kind of a fade. Now, uh, Nicola is like many of these other stocks. Let me see if I can find that one. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't want to waste time on that right now, but uh, it makes electric cars. Uh, it's the first name to Tesla. This is Nikola Tesla, of course, and uh, they actually, I would show you the fundamentals on this stock, but it's currently uh, has like a negative PE of 23, and it is, has uh, revenues of, uh, what is it this year, $90,000. That's the revenue for this year. If actually, if I can find that, that would be worth. Worth interrupting for, but uh, I did want to point that out, but I really want to look here at very briefly at silver. Because silver is also one that they that they say is. Being pumped and uh, abused as far as the physical market. This is a, this now doesn't look really more annoying than any other uh, silver chart that I've seen. And this is the March contract. So it didn't start until May of last year. And here we are today. And on uh, like a, uh, let's just look at an hourly chart. Uh, this was the big run up people were talking about, but if you, you know, put it in perspective, it's not uh, really much of a run up at all. It's just getting back up to this resistance level. Uh, these are the prices of silver. So you see this is the March silver here and the contract spec is 5,000 5, uh, Troy ounces is one futures contract. This is showing you uh, our, so what they're saying is that there is more, there are more contracts out there than there is uh, silver unmined and pe the markets just have to wake up to that. Uh, who here hasn't heard about the uh, silver bear uh, bull market? Anybody been a silver bull for more than 20 years? I'm looking at the class, which is on this screen, I'm sorry. Yes. Very good. Hopefully you've had that silver a long time. Early last year, that was a great entry point, actually. Um, great entry point.
Yeah, it was it was not really too high. It's a good looking chart actually. But this is what we call a commitments of trader chart. This is put out by the government. And uh, for instance, this is for palladium. And you see all contracts outstanding. There are 10,000 contracts outstanding, which is 100 ounces of palladium per contract. And this just shows you the uh, positions out here. These are the commercials here, uh, the ones who produce palladium. So you'll notice they are uh, they are a little bit long, but they're mostly short because they are selling contracts against the palladium they are producing. And over here are the reportable speculators, the large speculators, and that includes swap dealers, managed money, and other reportables. And you can see the swap dealers, well, I don't know what they do, but managed money, I know what they do, and they're mostly long, as you see. And tradition is the managed money does better than the others. And these are other reportables and they are short. And these are the, what they call the non-reportables or these are the poor schmucks who trade commodities. And they are currently 14 to one uh, to 10 long. And that's palladium. But down here we have the most recent silver exchange report and that's 167,800 contracts. Uh, which represents 839,400,000 troy ounces, which equates to, what is that, about 29,000 U.S. tons worth of silver on, these, on the open interest on these futures contracts. So I don't know how that compares to the number of tons in the earth, uh, but people study that stuff and they write newsletters about it that you can subscribe to for $200 or $300 a year. This is a commitment of, uh, this is the same data uh, presented in this format. And uh, Dr. Winston is an expert on data presentation. And what do you think about the mapping between uh, the chart, the table I just showed you in this chart here? I, I was just asking Dr. Winston about that. What are the, again, what are the blue and the red supposed to be? Okay, so the, the red down here are the commercials. Uh, this is silver. So this shows you on the, and these are negative here uh, on this axis, uh, corresponding to the number of millions of contracts or whatever. So they are mostly short. And the blues are the large speculators. They're the ones normally that make money in the markets. And the yellows are the small speculators, the ones that don't have reportable positions like you and I. You see they're both on the long side uh, at this time, which goes back just to January of 2020. It's just hard to see the green line on the bottom because the bars make it hard to see. Yeah, I mean, that's why they need a consultant really to do this uh, website for them uh, for as far as graphics. We were sort of toughly trained ourselves, so. Oh, right. So yeah, there, but there's a whole thing on, on internet color rendition and it's kind of, kind of interesting and complex, but you want to spend time doing it. And so that is just, a, and then some people can make that trade, um, trade on the basis of commitments of traders. So uh, back to Lynn Lewis, uh, do you have any words for us today? I know you do. I do, I do. Um, and I dug into some past history of my relationships on the street and I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to present it without bias. You always do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, would you like me to begin? I sent you a copy of what I was speaking on. Yes, we are very excited to have Lynn talking to us about this today. And so if you have any questions, you can put it in chat. I may have time to look at chat now. I don't when I'm normally speaking, but Lynn, why don't you take it away? Okay. Thank you, John. And and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to your other guest speaker uh, about talking about data. Um, it's fascinating because today uh, it was just announced that Janet Yellen, who's now our Secretary of the Treasury, 
is going to uh, meet with Congress about um, curbing all of this stock market activity and try to value stocks based on fundamentals, that that is the reason why stocks go up and down. However, we all know that that is not necessarily the reason. So um, at any rate, uh, it's kind of, I'll be interested to hear about the, that congressional committee. Unfortunately, they need people that are in the trenches from the industry on that committee um, that really know the, the guts of what, what happens. So I'll do, I will, let me do my best to explain the GameStop, um, Reddit and Robinhood phenomena. So GameStop is um, an American business located in Grapevine, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas where I live. It's video game, gaming, retailer, and consumer electronics. In 2019, they had net income of 470 million. How did this small company create such a stir on Wall Street and Main Street? Is it that we're all locked down because of COVID with too much time? Was there a vendetta to shock the rich hedge funds or did it just get out of control? Just a background about the mechanics of the stock market. There's 13 US stock exchanges, NAS, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ and the CBOE are the largest. There was a new members exchange backed by large financial firms is being formed. And there's also a Miami International Holdings, which is an exchange formed by floor, former floor brokers. Um, it is important to note that prior to 2007, this market activity would probably not have happened. In 2007, the uptick rule was eliminated, which was certainly bad timing right before the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the uptick rule was that sales to be short sales had to be conducted at a higher price than the previous sale. So sales had to be conducted at a higher price than previous sales. Unfortunately, in my opinion, and a lot of historians will agree, this is the reason why Lehman and Bear Stearns both went bankrupt during this time period because all the short sellers piled on for Bear Stearns and Lehman. And uh, as I said, uh, it was really bad timing. And, and I think a lot of damage in the 2008 financial crisis may not have been incurred if the uptick rule had still been in force. Of course, after all this uh, happened, um, the, in 2010, the, um, the SEC and FINRA announced the um, alternative uptick rule, uh, in, which is called Rule 2001. This allows investors to exit long positions uh, before short selling occurs. This rule is triggered when a stock price is down 10% in a day and stays in place for the entire day of trading. So how do you know if something is a short sale? Um, in order to enact a short sale, it is necessary to borrow the stock so that the buyer of your sale has stock delivery on settlement date. Settlement date is T plus two. So within three days, you have to come up with either the stock or the money. The brokerage firms have entire departments for stock borrowing. So when a trade is entered and marked a short sale, it's necessary to indicate who is your borrower, that you will not be able to enter an order in the system unless you indicate who is your borrower. Now let's think about that. In the frenzy of all of this, would you have, to, would, would uh, anyone have time to call up JP Morgan and say, did such and such at so-and-so, were they able to actually borrow stock? Is this a legitimate borrow? And so what happens a lot of times is this creates what you call naked shorts. And a naked short sale is when it's illegal and it's when you don't have an actual stock borrow. Um, this stock borrow business, they have an entire departments at um, all of these big brokerage firms 
Goldman Sachs has huge stock borrow, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch. It's a huge business for them because they, they they'll lend a thousand shares at at uh, you know maybe 0.01, but if you lend lend hundreds of millions of shares, it, it it all adds up and it's a great revenue source for these. It's a simple revenue source. So where do they borrow the stock? So all of you have maybe have brokerage firms set up somewhere with maybe one of these big stock borrow places. And um, unbeknownst to you, you have long stock in your account. And say, for instance, I own one of the REITs, Vernado, which is a New York um, stock exchange listed REIT, and somebody wants to short sell Vernado. So my brokerage, one of my brokerage firms that I use is Raymond James. So Raymond James will lend a short seller my stock to be able to create a borrow and delivery. Now, nothing, I will never know about this transaction because it looks like in my account, I will always have a uh, uh, thousand shares of, of Vernado. Um, and so none of us will ever know that our stock has been subject to borrow. Um, as I said, it's a very uh, um, likely that a lot of your um, uh, stock has been lent on these borrows. Um, there are many ECNs, electronic connectivity networks, which are online trading. Ameritrade, Interactive Brokers, TradeStation, Robinhood, Zacks, Trade, Alibest, E-Trade, Webull, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, and Merrill Lynch, just to name a few. TD, Ameritrade, E-Trade, e Schwab, and Robinhood, they get paid for their order flow. Again, TD, Ameritrade, E-Trade, Schwab, and Robinhood gets paid for their order flow. This is why when you put in a trade with Robinhood on the Robinhood app, you don't have to pay a commission because Robinhood makes its money on selling your order flow to a, um, a, 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 a third party. Citadel actually, Citadel Securities is, um, the person that that the uh, entity that does the order flow for Robinhood in the second quarter of 2020 Robinhood received $180,000 from Citadel for their order flow. So John uh, and uh, our guest speak are talking about data and information and we know how valuable that is. So why would you buy Robinhood's order flow? Well, it gives you an edge on the market. Citadel Securities also has a very large hedge fund owned by Ken Griffin, and it's called uh, Citadel uh, LLC. It has 35 billion AUM and Griffin owns 85% of this, of the company. So um, could I ask a quick question? Sorry. Sure. Sure. Um, is that not considered like insider trading or like insider? Maybe? Yeah, actually there was a rule called the Volcker rule, which was uh, in, uh, which was enacted right after the financial crisis and the Volcker rule said that if you were a, um, a money manager or an investment bank, you were not allowed to do prop trading or proprietary trading. So it would be very easy if you were doing proprietary, if you were doing proprietary trading and you could see what all of your institutional clients were doing, how easy would that be to make money? For 64 quarters in a row, Goldman Sachs's prop trading made a profit. 64 quarters in a row. So think about that concept with uh, prop trading. And this is essentially, so the Volcker rule eliminated prop trading. And um, uh, uh, it, that, that totally went away. But again, I will mention that Citadel Securities um, 
in July of 2020 was fined $700,000 for front for running in front of retail orders. So um, what, what does that tell you? I mean, uh, do you think that they don't know what, what the heck's going on on the other side of their business? Um, I think we can all look at those conclusions. Does that answer your question? Okay. So um, here we have um, uh, uh, this little company, Robinhood. It was founded in 2013 by two college roommates from Stanford studying math, um, Vlad Tenev and Bayou Barat. Bat. The firm has had several run-ins with regulatory agencies. In 2018, they announced that it would begin to offer bank accounts. How cool is that? but it had not secured approval from financial regulators, which they were fined. In the same week, they released software that erroneously reversed the direction of customer trades. Buys went in as sales and sales were entered as buys. Tech issues were an ongoing problem. Clients were erroneously able to borrow infinite amounts of money uh, to, to multiply their stock bets. So, you know, they were borrowing millions of dollars when they wouldn't have had that kind of a line of credit. The app in March of 2020 seized up for two days, leading some customers to lose almost a million dollars. And they still don't have a customer service phone, unlike their competitors. Last month alone, the month of January, the site went down 19 times, more than two times as often as Charles Schwab or Fidelity. So um, I talked about buying order flow. There are five securities firms that pay small electronic or ECNs for their order flow. Citadel, G1 Execution, Virtu, and Wolverine. They account for 20% of all the New York Stock Exchange volume. A 20% of these five securities firms account for, for uh the New York, 20% of the New York Stock Exchange volume. And um, I think we just discussed, but why would you pay for order flow? Um, Robinhood, as I said, doesn't charge their customers a commission. So how do they make money? They sell their order flow to Citadel. Typically a client will place an order to buy 500 shares of XYZ with a limit of 39 and a quarter. Citadel will go into a dark pool or a, uh, uh, electronic market, they'll buy the stock for $39.13 and sells it to the client for $39.15. He'll be able to trade through the bid and the offering and make a small percentage. When the New York Stock Exchange went from fractions, uh, 1 16th was the smallest fractional share, to decimals in 2001, it changed the entire complexity of trading. Think about there were only 10 price points in a stock. And in 2001, when trading turned to decimals, there are 100 price points in a stock. Therefore, it was easier to make markets and trade in de decimals. Um, um, as I mentioned, I gave you a background about, about Citadel. So let's go back to last week. In the middle of the market frenzy, Robinhood became a cultural phenomena and a Silicon Valley darling making it easy to put millions at risk in the stock market as it, as it would be to go out and summon an Uber. Amateur traders against hedge fund bigwigs. Then Robinhood was at the mercy of the very industry it had vowed to upend. As the trading mania grew, the financial system's risk reduction mechanisms managed by the DTCC. That's DTCC. Depository Trust and Clearing Corp. And they clear and settle most of the stock trading. They notified its member firms that the total cushion, which was then 26 billion, needed to grow to 33 billion within hours. Because Robinhood customers were responsible for so much of the trading, Robinhood was responsible for footing a significant portion of the bill. So, um, Let's think about this. Um, they had, the DTTC had to come up with the money. Um, Robinhood had to come up with this money because they were the big players in GameStop. And that was the stock that was creating this, this uh, um, separation between um, uh, 
the money that was needed to deposit for all of these uh, short sellers and margin calls. And um, so the DTC, it, this amount is not negotiable. I will repeat, this amount is not negotiable. If you can't meet the margin call, you are effectively shut down. You're shut down if you can't meet a margin call. Um, and when stocks are swinging wildly or there's a flurry of trading, the size of the cushion, it depends from each member, can, can grow on very, very short notice. So everyone's blaming Robin Hood for not allowing traders to execute trades. But the bottom line is it was the regulatory agencies that came in and said, hey, you can't issue any more um, uh, you can't borrow any more stock for short sales, just as Dr. Doberman just showed up that um, that if you wanted to short game stock right now, it would be very difficult to borrow it. So they only allowed buys on the stock. They eliminated the short selling and they put on their restricted list about three or four other stocks. I think AMC was one of them. I know one of them was a REIT called Mace Rich. Um, so there were several they put on their restricted list. So it was not Robin Hood that shut down their trading on these stocks. It was the regulatory agencies. That That's should be part of that. Yes. So last Thursday, I thought Robin Hood stopped all the buy trades and not the sell trades. So why was that? Why did they stop the buys and not the sells? I think because some of the short trades sales that they were trying to buy back may have been naked shorts. Okay, because that looks so really that, suspicious that they did that. It, yes, it does. It does. And I think they were, I, I would guess they were naked shorts. Okay. Because at one point, one of uh, Dr. Doberman's students asked the question that how could 140% of GameStop's stock outstanding uh, be shorted? I mean, you can't short 140% right. of the stock. You could, right? Okay, so uh, I, that's that. That's my suspicion. Uh, but I'm thinking, I don't know that we'll ever know. So anyway, all of a sudden, we need to have an infusion of capital um, for uh, uh, GameStop, I mean, for Robinhood to continue its trading apparatus. Um, now, um, Citadel Securities and J.P. Morgan Chase generating additional hundreds of millions on, of money on short notice is not a problem. But for Robinhood, it was a mad scramble. Now, this is something that I find exceedingly interesting. When it cobbled together the need for cash from its credit line investors, customers couldn't buy GameStop, ANC, and other shares, allowing its investors to sell volatile stocks, but not buy them. So what happened was, is ultimately the company succeeded in pulling together a billion dollars for some of its existing investors, including venture firms, Sequoia and Rivet. Robinhood issued special shares to these investors. Now here's the two guys that jumped right in with uh, an additional 2.4 billion, Citadel, and 72. Stephen Cohen's firm is 0.72. And if anyone knows the background about Stephen Cohen, his former firm was known as SAC, uh, which stood for Stephen A. Cohen, his initials. Um, he was fined $1.8 billion for insider trading and banned from the industry for three years. He is now worth $14 billion. He owns the New York Mets. He has been disciplined and sued many times for sexual discrimination and employee cruelty. And the movie Billions, if you've seen it with Damian Lewis, was sort of based on his life. Citadel and Point 72 ponied up with another $2.4 billion. In return, what did they get? Convertible bonds that can convert into equity at a 30% discount for stock in a public offering or convertible into 30 billion of equity. So, I mean, I find it fascinating that these big players want to be hands-on with a, a firm like Robinhood 
who only has retail individual investors. And, and as we will later hear um, uh, from data gathering information that is so important, these firms are privy to what kind of order flow is being seen from the retail investor. So during the frenzy, uh, it was bad for hedge funds with short positions. There was a small firm, small when I say they only had 12 and a half billion in assets under management. Melvin Capital was down 53% in January and had to take a $2.7 billion cash infusion from Citadel and 0.72, the same two players. As part of the deal, they got non-controlling stock in Melvin. Melvin is founded by star portfolio manager, Gabe Plotkin, who was at 0.72. Plotkin started his firm with 12 and a half billion and now has 8 billion after infusion of capital from Citadel in 0.72. So um, I think this is all an interesting um, concept that you have these huge players and um, our new, one of, one of the new appointees to the government regulatory commissions is now talking about assembling the 12 firms. There's 12 firms that control probably the greatest percentage of the volume in, 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 in sort of dictate what goes on in the stock market if you control for 12 people people like blackstone state street the, the big etf players vanguard vanguard blackstone etf i mean um state street come to mind because they're the they're the biggest etfs exchange traded funds um so robin hood what next its app was downloaded more than six hundred thousand times last friday six hundred thousand times by comparison, the app was downloaded around 140,000 times during its most active day in March of 2020. Looks like in spite of all of this, Robin, had, Robin Hood had a good week. So where does everyone get all this information uh, about what to short, what to buy, what to sell? There is another um, uh, app called Reddit. This is a social news aggregation rating and discussion website. It was founded by University of Virginia, Steve Hoffman and Alexis O'Hannon, Alexi O'Hannon. They were purchased by Condé Nast, I bought them in 2011 and in 2014, they broke from Condé Nast and raised $50 million in funding. They have a website called Wall Street Bets. This site has 8 million subscri subscribers. 8 million subscribers to a website called Wall Street Bets. This is where all of the chat was generated about GameStop stop last week with the plan to spook the short sellers. The company has an approximate value of 3 billion. They make their money on subscriptions and advertising and 2018 net revenues was 100 million. So um, what you know, what are some of the possible solutions to restoring investor confidence in the stock market? Um, should we pay a transaction fee for high frequency trading? Even 0.01 would create 80 billion a year. Uh, should we disclose short positions? Long positions have to be disclosed when an owner accumulates more than 5%. Should we end payments for order flows? No more free trading, but the clients might get better stock prices. Or should maybe we should just return to the Buffett rule. Everyone making over a million dollars uh, should pay 30% tax on cap gains. It would make more of a fair sense of the system. So um, anyway, that those were some of the things that um, Andrew Ross Sorkin uh, who is a friend of mine, uh, wrote in DealBook about would these be possible solutions to restoring investor confidence? And it'll be interesting to see what the regulatory bodies come up with with Janet Yellen. So that concludes um, what I have to say uh, about the GameStop, Robinhood, Reddit um, fiasco. Uh, it made, it's an interesting time and um, we shall see how this will play out.
Uh, Dr. Doberman, any questions, anything? Well, first I would like to give you a big hand. That was just absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> Most everyone was listening with um, rapt attention, actually. It's very interesting. You can see that on the screen. So uh, that was, <clears throat> did you know Joe Saluzzi? You remember him from Eubank Conference? He did broken markets during the HFT conference we were at, or do you know yes, him? I met I didn't know him prior, but I met him and he's very, very fascinating. Very fascinating. Have you all read his book? Well, he's got a couple of them, but uh, his Broken Markets book. I read Broken Markets a while back. It explains how you make money on top of the order flow, on top of the vapor, on top of the water, like a rapids kind of thing. And that's where they're making the most of the money is in those little tiny droplets. Well, that's, that's, as I said, that's why these two huge hedge funds, you know, they can write a check for a billion like you and I would write a check for $50. And so, you know, to be, it, it, it just, I mean, I think it's phenomenal that these two big players bailed out Robin Hood. I mean, it just speaks to them wanting to those already to have, a partner, though. To those already a partner. Pardon? Citadel was, has been a partner for a long time with Robin Hood. What I find very strange is the fact that how can you sell your order flow to your partner? That is very odd. Right. Um, I, I don't know that it would, they be, they probably have just a broker dealer arrangement. I don't know that it would be quote considered a partner because a lot of these companies get around like with the Melvin hedge fund, they own stock, which is non-controlling. So perhaps that's the way they, they're able to get around that. Um, that, that I don't know the answer. But Citadel, yeah, Citadel uh, buys order flow uh, from not only Robinhood, but a lot of these other entities. It's um, a phenomenal deal for them because they get um, just like lots and lots of, of uninformed trading randomly. They sure. Trade. They make the spread and they just keep making it. And exactly. I think, and I think uh, Wayne had a, a point of, on that. Well, I mean, one on the, the thing that's interesting to me is like last Thursday again, why they outlawed the the buys because there was a rumor on Twitter. Now, who knows if Twitter is true? That right before Robin Hood said that you couldn't buy, Citadel did a massive short. Now that would be horrible, would it not? If like Citadel told Robin, if Citadel it's knew they were going to have to buy, yeah. that's like because right. they would make a fortune. Exactly, they would. So, I mean, that was the rumor. Does anybody know if that was true? Can they check that? I, I've heard they're even I, involved in the silver trade, man. I, I, the short sales, as I said, you know, if you want to find out who owns positions in stock, you could easily find out who the largest stockholders are. Um, there's services that you pay for that you can find out who, the, who owns the largest number of shares um, of, of any stock, but it doesn't list short positions. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't list short positions. And when allegedly, um, the reason why the markets allow so much short selling is that it creates liquidity. Right. That's the, that's the. So market the, makers can be short for two days naked um, without any conditions. And so exactly. technically they should be able to buffer anything like that. Um, but this time it was just very strange situation. Very strange. No, they, but see, that's because there were so many naked shorts. So you, you know, you're, if you get fun, if you, when you, when you naked short something, um, that's, that's finable. So you, you, you're not allowed. I mean, that's wrong to do that. Um, and as I said, um, when I would enter orders on, on the uh, ECNs and they were short sales, 
you know, when I, I did business with a lot of hedge funds, well, all the big hedge funds I did business with. And the first thing I would say is, who's your borrow? And I could not enter an order unless I listed a borrow. But do you think I had time to call the borrow up and say, does um, XYZ company, did they borrow 400,000 shares of Citicorp for this short sale? I, I don't know that information. I can't get that information. I think like- Do you explain I, naked shorts again? Pardon me? Uh, could you explain naked shorts again? A naked short is that you have an R of the stock. So you sell a security and you have no way of delivering those shares. And the only way that you can get around this entire phenomena without getting fined is to buy it back before settlement date. So that's why uh, there was, that's why a lot of these buyers um, were probably, I'm guessing, this is a guess, an edu a somewhat educated guess. But a lot of these, uh, the buying was restricted because I think the regulators wanted to find out if it, how, how much of this was naked shorting. And, and I think with 140% of the float being shorted, there was probably 40% of the short sales that were naked. Does that answer your question? My my biggest concern with this whole situation is that you know what's going to end up happening? They're going to introduce something like the pattern day trading rule, which like honestly only uh, hinders people with small amounts of capital on trading. And they're going to try and uh, price out uh, the little guy. That's what always happens. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think the market should be free. I mean, if you want to sh even make it short, I don't think there should be a problem, uh, but you have to contend with the risk that you're going to get squeezed out. And if you do, you're going to lose money, you know, so. Um, suppose you're a buyer. I'm sorry. Um, suppose you buy this stock that somebody naked shorted you. You couldn't get delivery. You know, that's illegal. If you bought something and paid money for a stock, you'd want your stock delivered. Oh, they have to buy it regardless, right? Right. Well, Yes, There's this it's to buy. Like if you're if you're uh, like short an option and you have to take the stock, you have to take it, right? right. So um, the problem is that usually more regulation ends up creating different inefficiencies, and those different inefficiencies lead to, you know, and they more exactly. more pain and more like weird bubbles in random places that shouldn't exist because government tried to, to um, change the way that people do their trading. It should be free, in my opinion. Uh, but other than that, like this whole situation needs to clear, be cleared up. We can't have like um, what's going on. If you on. look at the price charts, I just have to say the situation is clearing up. These stocks are going back down exactly. and things are basically in uh, the kind of shape you would expect to see them. Um, but then a lot of the little investors lost a fortune, right? Lost a lot of money because they bought it when it was high and they're getting killed, right? Just like the people that bought in 1928 or oh, no, no, I'm 1929. Not but I guess my question would be the government, I guess, will they nail these people who did the naked shorts, do you think, Lynn? No, they're, they're not going to be able to find them, Wayne. Oh, God. Because they... Cause they they bought the stock back and they've lied about their borrow. Oh my God, because that's going to like really, a, if, no. if the public understood that, they'll be furious. No, and you know, as Eduardo was saying about the government rules, I mean, they, they, dis, they brought about the 2008 financial crisis by eliminating the short sale on the uptick, in my opinion. And that's what historians say as well. Oh gosh. Because they piled on, they, they took Lehman down, they hated Lehman. Everybody in the financial service world hated Lehman. Dick Fold was like, you know, well, we could go on. But they hated Lehman. They didn't like Bear Stearns, and they wanted Bear Stearns to be acquired cheaply by someone. And so they drove these um, the, they drove the stocks to zero by shorting. 
So do you think the government will, like some people have said, Wall Street bets is guilty of manipulating the market? Do you think the government will try and nail them on that? I think what the government, first of all, the government doesn't understand anything that we're talking about right now. What should they do? Okay. Um, I think they should employ experts on this. They should get people that are in the pits of trading that understand all these rules and regulations. And I don't know that that that, that, that will happen. They have people like Jamie. They have people like Jamie Dunn on the committee. All that happens throughout this time is that they pumped the stock at the time after Citadel had already acquired the naked shorts from uh, Melvin and so on. And then they can churn it, like with their market making engine, they can just like churn the stock and get out of the position. In the meantime, everyone that bought thinking that they were, you know, fighting against the big guy, they are left holding it, right? So ultimately, do we even know if it was ready that pump it or if it was like, you know, Citadel um, with their bots going on Reddit and pumping those those things? We don't know. Like it's so easy right now. Yeah tree to to fake uh writing you know so at this point it's just a matter of um we gotta figure out what what the hell happens because i'll tell you what, we need to look at the stock market and the different companies as investments we need to to buy things for their underlying value we should not be in, you know, and if you think that the stock is trading at too high of a multiple based on what the earnings are going to be, then short it. But, it, it, you know, it's, I, I think we've taken this to, to gain form. Like I said in the beginning, um, but do we have too much time on our hands right now? Because we're all locked down with COVID. I mean, these kind of things, this games uh, stop phenomena goes on every minute of every damn day. Every minute of every day, something, this happens. With this much volatility, probably not. So but it goes. So it seems to me like it may be a normal thing, a normal phenomenon for the markets, right? And so maybe it's not about more regulation, maybe it's a matter of education. I, I, Eduardo, I hate to, I think you sort of, I hate to put words in your mouth, um, Ms. Lewis, but I think you're talking about since COVID, the number of GameStop style trading that goes on, you're saying has increased or am yes. I getting that correct? Okay. Okay. I think that's a distinction that you're saying is purely because of COVID. I, maybe and so. that's becoming normal. Yeah. Correct. I, 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 I'm thinking so. I, I, right. I, however, but what I'm saying is that um, Brandon, these, these um, issues with volatility in stocks in the whisper markets, they call them the whisper, the whisper rumor that um, Jeff Bezos is going to leave Amazon and, you know, does he have a deep bench? Should we short Amazon because the stock's going to fall when they, when the announcement actually hits the public? You know, there's a lot this goes on all the time. It's since this, this happens all the time. Um, and so, um, and, and also that, you know, the structure of the market is different. Right now, the ETFs rule the market. Um, and those, those vehicles have, it's difficult to stock pick now. It's difficult to buy a portfolio of say 25 stocks. I mean, you're better off buying um, an ETF. And now a lot of the bigger mutual fund groups are offering mutual funds that are a basket of ETFs. So you're paying mutual fund management fee and an ETF management fee. You know, what about that makes sense? So, the traditional style of money management, of stock picking, of research information is, seems like yesteryear to me. Shouldn't that, I, I mean, I hate to sound like the 
new guy on the block in terms of how investors should think. But because of the age of information, specifically, like you talked about Amazon, for example, right? Obviously, they have all of their, uh, you know, uh, uh, warehouses and and like their shipping and all of those like physical products that they sell to consumers. But then they also have right AWS, which one they generate more money through, but also is a more valuable type of asset for Amazon. Um, and then when it comes to that, right, like you can't have the uh, value, or I don't want to say value investment, but what you were talking about, the traditional methods of picking a stock. I think, right, it's much harder to value Amazon when you take into account all of their intellectual property or a company like Apple or even someone like Robinhood, right? Because, right, intellectual property has become much more important over, I don't want to say physical assets because it's not really a good word to use, but more traditional assets, right? Like Bezos leaving Amazon is a really big deal, not only because he's the CEO and founder, but also he's been the idea maker for Amazon, right? So how will the company change in terms of the movements they make apart from their actual traditional like cash flow sheets, balance sheet, all that information. So I think to say that reverting back to traditional methods um, should, should go on, I think it's also a lot harder for a reversion to occur because you can't actually think of companies the same like you could previously, right? I, I agree. Yes, right? so. and it, to me, it was the introduction of the ETFs, the exchange traded funds. That's what changed fundamentals on Wall Street. Because I mean, I must, I mean, I own a bunch of ETFs, um, and um, and and you know, the bottom line to all of this what we're talking about right now is how cheap money is. I mean, it is incredibly cheap. When you had to borrow stock on margin, when, uh, when I, was, I played a lot in the options um, market, unfortunately, one of my, uh, when I was on a trading desk one time, the, the guy next to me was an option specialist. And that was the beginning of the end of my little fortune that I had amassed in the stock market when I started doing that. But back then, you know, to borrow money for margin and for options, it was, uh, and this was like in the early 90s, was eight, nine percent. And, you know, think about that, how much you'd have to make on a trade to be able to, to cover that interest. But now money is so cheap that you can think, you think of what you could think of all the leverage you can have. I mean, even the, the companies, like we talked about um, uh, Tillman Fertitta in Houston, uh, how much, you know, if he has like 200 million in cash flow, he can leverage that up to several billion dollars. So, you know, it's, it's it, this, it, I think, that we are trying to protect everyone in our country with low interest rates. We're trying to be fair. Um, but in the same time, it's created things like these SPACs, you know, which are absolutely, it, can you imagine someone coming to you and saying, hey, could you give me a million dollars for this trust? because I think I'm going to go out and buy some dilapidated buildings in Detroit and I'll give you a 7% return. And that's what's going on with these SPACs. And they're all basically blind pools of private equity money. Because people are, I mean, I myself, I think this stock with the low cost of money, it forces people like myself at my age in life who should be traditionally conservative to be more risky because I, I can't really get yield anywhere. And it uh, forces you. Has some of them worked in that semi industry? So I was managing like $2 billion, you know, it, it's not a little. And um, I'm gonna tell you the biggest problem is that the vast majority of portfolio managers and analysts, they're grifters. They don't know what they're doing. They're just bullshitting all the time. And so um, 
to change the industry, you have to change the people in it. And that's a big problem. Big, big problem. Because well, on a positive note, I wonder if uh, any of you all would like to chime in because we are running out of time. We have uh, about two minutes uh, to hear the rest of your questions. So let's go around the room if you have any. Yes, I have a question. Um, go ahead. Yes, regarding GameStop, you, you mentioned that at one point they stopped allowing purchasing GameStop, but selling was it still allowed? I'm just confused that how is that, how is that possible? Who, who's taking the other side of selling trade? Well, these might have been legitimate sellers because but people who was like buying the, the shares. Someone, someone should buy this. I was, oh, um, I, I think the people that were buying the shares at the time might have been covering naked shorts. Because think you know, forty percent of the stock was shorted was were naked shorts. Forty percent okay. of the flow, so they had to. I mean, you know, essentially it's T plus two, okay, when you buy a stock or sell a stock. However, they will give you extensions and extensions and extensions, okay. So maybe you have a week to settle a trade legitimately. Um, even though it's supposed to be T plus two. So that'll give you a while to buy the stock back and then cover your short and all's well and good. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Then, uh, just saying, just saying, we'll come right back to you. Just saying we have one minute to go. So if any of y'all need to hop off here and do something else, go right ahead. Uh, but we're going to just keep going until we need to leave. Uh, so I had a question. So you mentioned earlier that the 0.72 owner was like fine billions of dollars for insider trading and is kind of, you know, not perceived as that great of a guy. But then now the yeah, 0.72 kind of bailed out Robin Hood and they're are they now also getting their uh, their trade flow as well? Because that seems like you're almost giving the data to the bad guys now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Stephen Cohen, um, Stephen Cohen had, did you see Billions with Damian Lewis? Okay. Watch Billions. It's incredible because that's based on Stephen Cohen will deny it, but and Stephen Cohen wishes he was that good looking, but <laughs> um, but anyway, um, it's they have all of this money, and money is power, and that's what they control. Uh, Stephen Cohen was fined one eight billion, and he had to give away all. He had to get rid of all of his managed money. He at one time had, I think, 100 billion AUM or something ridiculously high. And he was all he had to give away all of the public money that he, he managed at the time. And he was only allowed to manage his fam friends and family money, which was a mere 35 billion. So still, I mean, when you talk about numbers that this man is fined 1.8 billion for insider trading, that would be like us writing a check for $50. You know, I mean, in the big scheme of things, this does not punish them. So that, the, the, you know, the, the more, and see Wall Street caters to these powerful people because they're getting all their investment banking business from them. They're getting all their tips from them. They're getting all their, their uh, commissions from them. I mean, it goes on and on and on. It's a good old boys network. And it's the same crap that has been going on forever. I have to leave, but thank you. Hi, Wayne. Hi, nice meeting you. And thanks, everybody. I will get out of here. I'll leave. Okay. Just keep going without me, don't worry. <laughs> okay. I guess, kind of on that note, like, of just, you know, like Wall Street cares to these people. Um, what do you think the political chances are of something being done to like the hedge funds and like a, I mean, the fail to deliver like you mentioned the T plus two rule and the fact that they have a week to deliver. 
Um, but it seems like really the strategy that the hedge funds used was uh, kind of just demoralizing the entire, like the population by um, like by just waiting it out, right? Like they waited a week and now we're back down to $60. And so now they can just buy back their shares at $60 and then they don't have to pay like the short squeeze prices that everyone was expecting. Um, but they did that through like fail to delivers and like loopholes that SEC offers. Um, like you mentioned, like I think Citadel got fined 700,000 but compared to the gains that they that they get from this, these kinds of trades, um, like that's nothing to them. No. So what do you think the chances are of something actually being done on Capitol Hill, especially when I know the SEC, I think there was a news report today, they're looking at tweets by like, again, retail investors rather than actual like hedge fund behaviors, potential short ladder attacks, um, all these things that, you know, like retail investors are upset about, but it seems like the SEC is just going to go back to, uh, and, and like defend like the, the revolving door um, of the people in, in the hedge funds. Yes, that's what's going to happen. Um, and you know, here, here's, the, here's the thing. If, if I'm Goldman Sachs and Citadel comes into me and says, look, I need to borrow a million shares of, of GameStop for short. And you come in and you wanna borrow a thousand shares of GameStop for sure. Where do you think the bar is going to go? Not to me. <laughs> exactly. So you're, you know, it's this, it's all about all of this powerful money. And, you know, Wall Street's mantra ever since, I mean, I've been in the industry, I was in the industry for 37 years, and I worked on trading desks for 37 years, and I saw a lot of changes in the industry. And Wall Street's mantra was, make a rule and I'll find a way around it. You know, I mean, it's what it's, I mean, they're the best and the brightest minds that go to work in these environments. And, you know, it, they're, it's, they're brilliant. Uh, yes, as Eduardo said, they're a bunch of grifters, perhaps, but they're really wealthy, powerful grifters. And it's just the way this whole phenomena is. And I think the beginning of the end was when the ETFs started to take over the market. And that's a whole other story, but the ETFs started to control the market. Money managers now, you know, good money managers can't even charge um, 20 basis points to manage a, a billion dollar mandate. I mean, they, they can hardly make money, you know, on those kind of managements. And, and how are they going to make money by cobbling together some ETFs and offering it to their shareholder, you know, their, their investors as, as a concept? Would you buy a mutual fund and pay a 15 bips for, to buy a bunch of ETFs? No, no. And that's what they're resorting to. So active money management has gone has practically gone away because people are not actively able to beat the ETFs. Well, and so, it, yes, I was wondering if like the move away from active management was sort of like a, a natural evolution because isn't the whole point of you know using ETFs to mitigate risk, um, so so that you protect your downside from like. Uh, certain companies going under, you have a, a broad basket of things. So, you know, statistically, you lower your risk on, on your investment. Yes, I agree with that. But when you look at the ETFs, and there are three firms that control all of the ETFs, I think that's dangerous. Blackstone, State Street and Vanguard control 90% of the ETFs issued. And I just think when you don't have more competition in an industry, plus the fact these ETFs mark to the market three or four times a day, I, I'd have to do a little more due diligence on that, but I think they mark to the market three or four times a day. And they, so they balance. But I would, 
I would almost bet money on the fact that these, that when the ETFs close at the end of the day, they're not 100% balanced because there's just some stocks. When at the end of the day, between of the stock market time, years three, between 250 and 305, the stock could go up or down 10% based on the ETFs rebalancing at the end of the day. That's wrong. I mean, I just think that is not, you know, that's a big risk. Okay. So they've, they've created a market for themselves that in order to make money in the stock market, you have to own an ETF. And then three firms get all the fees from them. So anyway. Uh, and I have another I question about um, sort of like what, what you think about rule enforcement, especially like 0.72, because after Stevie Cohen, you know, got in trouble and had SAC shut down, um, 0.72 was a family office. Uh, do you know why they were able to manage outside money in 2018 and onward? Or wouldn't it uh, be he, normally like a lifetime ban on managing outside money after insider trading? It was no, it wasn't. No, okay. No, it was restricted, and he had good lawyers, and they appealed, and they appealed again, and you know it was the highest fine ever paid for a securities violation, one point eight billion. But you know, I mean, when you have that kind of net worth that he has, I mean, he bought the Mets for crying out loud you know, just to have a little uh, um, diversion on the side. You know? I mean, it's, 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 and as again, I will keep saying, I keep hearkening back, but it's this low interest rate environment and how cheap it is to borrow money. It's so cheap to, to borrow money and to leverage your life away um, that why wouldn't you? Um, on that note, we, like, oh, sorry, if, yes. if you want to, Finish your sentence, Miss Lewis. But on the no, but Jerome Powell was. And, and what do we know? I mean, Jerome Powell has said we're going to have cheap money for the next several years, right? Isn't that what he said? Because we're going to we're going to um, have to recover from what COVID has done to our economy. That's all I wanted to say. So it's a fait accompli. Um, yeah, but I was going to ask. Yeah, it's kind of about Jerome Powell, but over the fact that, I mean, over the past like three years, four years, the Fed has been saying they'll think about raising rates and then ultimately don't end up doing them or maybe even lower them a little bit. Or if they do raise, right, it's like the fractional that's expected. Um, do you think that there should actually be an overhaul in the thinking from that, like from the Fed's perspective on what is like the value of borrowed money? I mean, I know that you think it should be higher, but like how, how soon should that occur? Well, I think they were headed in that direction, Brandon, but then COVID came around. Right. And that's changed the, that's changed our entire world. I mean, you look at companies that used to be thriving companies. I mean, here's a statistic, 44% of our GDP are small businesses, 44% small businesses. That's 30.7 million businesses. Okay, 10 million are closed permanently. Um, 15 million have laid off to the bare bones and have no intentions of rehiring people until probably 2023. That's pretty grim. So there's such, there's a huge bifurcation in our world again, you know, the inequality in our country has created so much hate and skepticism and mistrust. And it's, it's just, um, and again, a lot of it is a faction that we can borrow cheaply. And <clears throat> did you see the article? <clears throat> I forget where it was, but uh, the latest uh, median income for families of five is like thirty-six thousand dollars in no. the United States as of twenty twenty. Wow. 
And 60, 60% are below uh, 50,000. Right, I, I believe that. I mean, let's, let's look at, you know, I mean, as I said, um, there's going to be committees that are going to bring to the table what they, who they call the big 12 in our country of people that control all the capital markets. If, if it's in the hands of 12 firms, which is most of them are 12 people. Twelve firms and thirteen exchanges. Yeah, right. Um, I have a, yeah. yeah, I have a question. So, what do you think about value investment during this day? Because, like, when you look at the Buffett index, it is so high compared to you know during the over uh, past decades. So, what do you think about value investment? Um. You know, it's it's really hard. I I do not have a lot of I mean, I don't have a lot of information on on Buffett and value investments. I know he's been a very successful buyer because he buys you know good assets cheaply, which I guess is the definition of value. Um, but um, uh, I, I'm sure there's pockets of our country right now where you can you can create value just by means of the fact that there's certain uh, pockets that have been totally beaten down. I mean, you know, New York real estate is down 40% since before COVID. Uh, both of the coasts, I mean, the West Coast is in bad shape. And so I'm sure there's value plays on both sides of it. It would just be a matter of being smart enough to seek them out. All right, let's take one more question because we should probably let uh, Ms. Lewis go to lunch. <laughs> I know I've asked a lot, but if no one else has a question, I have one last one. Go ahead. Um, so you've talked about like the sort of state of what is a good stock, what is a good company based off of earnings that it can produce, why it should be shorted. Um, but on like a larger, more macro scale, dealing with the economy, uh, Right. Most people talk about the state of the economy essentially as like the state of the stock market and then like maybe throw in healthcare right after that and maybe real estate right after that. Um, do you think the perception of what is the economy should change so that we can have like a better uh, right so that the stock market doesn't have all of the volatility that you talked about earlier on a day to day basis in terms of people buying, you know, risky bets essentially, or the healthcare and insurance industry, not necessarily being as broken as it is, or even real estate, right? For example, the split between the coasts and what is Midwest America. Well, Brandon, I'll tell you, if I could answer that question, I, I think I would buy a private island somewhere and just- <laughs> I know it's a hard question. I just wanted to get your thoughts for sure, yeah. <laughs> With my private airplane and my private helicopter pad, but um, it, I, um, you know, I, I think the market right now is so out of control with all of the different instruments that are coming out. And I think that, um, I, you know, I think it's everybody's focus now. And I'll tell you what changed all of this was in, in the early 90s, 1992, we have Ted Turner to thank for the 24 sensation of, sensation of 24 hour news. And everybody said it wasn't gonna work. But look at, the, I mean, how much information, 24 hours, how many channels do we have right now that we can flip to for 24 hour news? And so I think everyone is focused on all of this. I was on the trading desk in 1987, which was the largest percentage crash ever in the history of the stock market, October 19th, 1987. I was on the trading desk. After, at the end of that day, I um, met a portfolio manager friend of mine at a local bar. We, you know, the stock market was down a huge, we lost tons of money. All of our clients have lost money. 
We sat at the bar, we looked at the three televisions. One of them had a baseball game on the World Series. The other one had the weather on and the other one had a local soap. How do you think right now with GameStop, how many people, if they'd gone to a bar, if they'd gone to a restaurant, if they'd gone somewhere, if they're sitting in an airport lounge, would they have seen the local weather as soap or a baseball game on the news? No, they'd all be focused on the happenings of the sensationalization of the stock market. So no, I don't think we're going back. Well, I guess on that note, we'll have to wrap it up for today. <laughs> Lynn, that was incredible. And thank you all for these excellent questions. Oh. Yes, I really thank you. I really, I really enjoy well. it. It gets, gets my um, adrenaline going. It's, it's fun. It really is fun since I live on adrenaline rushes. <laughs> oh, well, she really does. Let me prove it. <laughs> I can prove it right here. And here is my, this is Lynn's blog. And this is the most recent uh, trip that she was on. She's been to every, every well, she has dived in every, all seven seas. And this is just, uh, this is, looks like Spain. Uh, is that right? It was, that was uh, Brazil. Brazil. And that's where that's where I was in March and came back uh, from Rio with a COVID invested air, uh, a COVID infected airplane. Oh goodness! Good grief! Yeah. yeah. Well, she's got blogs like this from all over, as you can see, and so she's quite the experienced traveler. Well, thank you. Its wings have been clipped the last year, but here we go. <laughs> Time gets its meaning. Well, some of us can certainly vouch for time, can't we? Yes, yes. And you were there. Yes. Queen, called Queen Sonia. Yes, or, this was, I was, yeah, I was in, um, I, I spent a month in, in uh, uh, Norway. She was visiting. And they're just more and more than plus they're damn good pictures too. Oh, wow. They're beautiful subjects. Well, uh, that is just some of the stuff that Lynn does when she's not going to London to be on the London Film Festival uh, competition and when she's not doing all the uh, charitable work that she does. Uh, in the Texas area for uh, uh, people in prison and uh, other charitable uh, outcomes. So, thank However, you. However, John, this, this is my favorite thing to do is to be in your class and lecture. This, out of all the things I do, I enjoy this the most. It gets my brain cells working on a different level and my adrenaline rush. Well, it was certainly fun exercising our brain cells keeping up with you. Especially so that DTCC you. tongue twister. I like that one. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to end it for today. All uh, right. Lynn, thank you so much. Thank you. And I, th I am sorry about your 